The adjustment of protection systems can be done without installed power transistors and a transformer. To do this, about 12 volts are supplied to the input of the inverter and slowly lowered to simulate a discharge of the battery. The protection should work at a voltage of about 10 volts. The corresponding indicator will light up. When the voltage rises, the protection will not reset until the hysteresis threshold is exceeded, that is, the supply voltage will not be 0.5 volt, higher than the voltage at which the protection worked. The same is in the case of overvoltage protection, only the switching hysteresis in this case is about 1 volt. All power tracks on the board must be reinforced with copper wires and tinned abundantly with solder. Power transistors are installed on a common radiator and must be insulated from it with thermal gaskets and plastic bushings. The acoustics protection unit is designed to protect the dynamic head when the power transistors of the amplifier burn out. If that happens, there is a high probability of direct current incoming the speaker. As a result, it will quickly burn out. This protection also provides a delay when system turning on, that is, the acoustics aren't turned on immediately, but a couple of seconds after the power is applied to the protection circuit. This minimizes the influence of transition processes and the formation of audible clicks in the acoustics when switching on. Protection is realized according to the relay circuit from the legendary rig amplifier. I inserted on the board a power supply with a rectifier which makes it possible to power the protection unit directly from alternating voltage from additional transformer windings. But in the final version, the power for this unit is taken from the output of the inverter, from the plus and the midpoint. The switching element is a relay with a 24 volt coil. When more than 1 to 1.2 volt of the DC voltage appears at the input of the protection unit, the circuit instantly reacts. As a result, the relay and acoustics in general are turned off. The protection unit is universal and can work with amplifiers of any class. The low-pass filter adder is intended for summing the signal from stereo channels into one signal and filtering unnecessary frequencies. This filter is active, built on a BA4558 dual operational amplifier microcircuit and provides a cutoff 100 Hz. That is, the filter removes all frequencies that are above 100 Hz and below 100 Hz is amplified and goes to the low frequency amplifier input. As a result, from the sub, you only only hear the low frequencies, the so-called bus. The filter has its own volume control, which is the main and only one in this system. The filter is powered over a wide voltage range. It is important to note that the power supply is unipolar. It is possible and desirable to use an additional winding from the transformer of the inverter as a source. But in my case, again, the filter is powered from the same voltage as the protection unit. I should admit that independent source is much more preferable. The amplifier unit. I didn't think long about the choice of low-frequency amplifier because I started from the fact that I had a 75 GDN speaker. According to the classics of the genre, at first I wanted to make an amplifier on a TDA7294 microcircuit. Many do so. But this is class AB and a rather large radiator is needed. Although at cost, this is one of the cheapest options. There was an option to make an amplifier according to Dora Feeve in class B 50 watts, but the fact is that I had a long time assembled an adjusted D class amplifier based on the IR2153 half bridge driver and the LM311 comparator. Circuit got from the internet. You will find a link in the description. The board drawing is also not mine, I just slightly corrected some points, generated Gerbers and ordered a batch at the factory. Printed circuit boards for all blocks used in this project can be downloaded together with the general archive from the link in the description. There will also be Gerber files for ordering printed circuit boards at the factory of our sponsor GLCPCB. 
All you need to do is upload folders called Gerber to the company's website and select the options you need. Then you pay for the order and that's it. The factory can make boards of any complexity, size and number of layers. You can examine the appearance and check the board in a convenient viewer of Gerber files available on the website. The high quality and reasonable prices are guaranteed. The link to the GLC website can be found in the description under the video. This amplifier can give out power of 150 watts and even up to 300 watts to the load. With the appropriate power supply, technically with such parameters, it can burn the 75 GDN speaker. Therefore, after the system is fully connected, the volume level must be adjusted by rotating the variable resistor on the board. Everything is done according to the scheme, with the exception of the power MOSFETs. I have IRF540 installed. These are surface mount MOSFETs, but nothing prevents to lengthening the pins. The transistors are pressed against the radiator with a metal strip. Of course, both are isolated from the heat sink by a heat conducting gasket. The choke is the most critical part. I experimented with a variety of cores, both conventional ferret cores with gap and power diron, but uh, the best result was obtained with this ring. Its dimensions are in front of you. The ring was taken from a computer power supply unit. On it was wound the choke in 5 volt line of DC-DC converter. The inductance of the choke is about 35 microhenry. The wire diameter is 1.15 to 1.2 mm. It is advisable to wind it with the Litz wire and not with one wire like mine. Assembling. The supporting part in this structure is a radiator in the form of an aluminum plate. Dimensions are now in front of you. The power transistors of the inverter and the power amplifier are pressed against it. Believe me, this seemingly small radiator is enough for cooling. The temperature didn't rise above 50 degrees Celsius during working at a power of 50 watts for about an hour. The inverter itself doesn't heat up at all with this power. And don't forget that the amplifier is class D. In this design, several errors were made. I mean that some micro circuits set on the panels. They need to be removed and soldered on the board because later they can simply fall out from vibrations. The protection block is also poorly located. There is no access to the terminal screws. To disconnect the wires, you need to unscrew the board from the radiator. Ideally, it is desirable to remove all the screws and solder all connections. But in general, the design is quite reliable. Everything is fixed with metal corners. Ideally, you need to place all the blocks either on the same plane or collect everything on one board. But I was just too lazy. Big sized components were sealed with sealant and all joints were glued. The box is made of wood chipboard with a thickness of 18 mm. The front part is twice thicker and made of two sheets of the same material. As I said, I didn't make the box. A friend of mine did it long time ago based on calculations from an article by Alexander Korczynski. I will leave a link to this article in the description. All sizes are indicated there. This box completely copies the author's version from the article. The box volume is 40 liters. I don't know how well this box is made and to be honest I was not given such a task. I was merely asked to collect the electronic stuffing. There is a window on the side where the entire electronic part is embedded. Moreover, a separate small box was made for it so that the sub didn't have any effect on the board. In the end, the box was simply painted black. I don't have much experience with acoustic box sheeting. The phase inverter is tuned to 40 Hz. It's a round plastic tube with an inner diameter of 75 mm. On the front side, the edges are bent. It is factory-made part from some kind of subwoofer. Everything is assembled and ready to launch. Let's check it out. Tracks alas aren't the coolest. Well, you know about the copyright and all that rules.
Well, now, during operation, let's check the protection against over and under voltage. I can say in the end, thanks to the Chinese, nowadays any homemade devices became meaningless because ready-made is several times cheaper. Repairing equipment is also meaningless because new ones sometimes cost less than repairing old ones. This is how the technique nowadays artificially turned into disposable. Broke down, throw it out and buy a new one. It's cheaper. I can't advise you to repeat this design and not for the reason that it is bad, no. Quite the opposite, just not everyone can afford cost of $50 for electronic stuffing. It's easier to find used factory amplifier at online flea markets, but if you are a fan of homemade, then why not? There is nothing more pleasant when a handful of components that you soldered with your hands come to life and begin to live with their own life. That's all today. Don't forget to look at the description. There are all the boards and the links to the necessary materials that are worth studying. Well, on this, I say goodbye until we meet again. With you, as always, was Kassian TV.